If you go to slash, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to answer. I answered this in from memory a lot of the time, so that I can so that so I can clone it to a new machine, because I'm one of those fools who decides that you know what? It's been six months. I should wipe my machine. It's getting slow. <laughs> uh, AB Rose in classroom. Um, so once you go into here, right? Destruct folder is for you guys, for data structures. And then notice that there's a study guide created a year ago. So what you'll want to do is that while, so here it says that there's links, right? If you click on here, it says there's links, but then nothing's appearing. Uh, so what you want to do is click over here on download so you can actually get the actual file. Um, you need the actual file for it to work. So then you can open it and click on the links because if they're not open, right? And again, if you need more material, do if you need more study material, do the following. Data structures final exam. Possibly add the word Java to it. Um, let's see, does file files PDF? I don't know if it does. Um, yeah, and then if you add the PDF, then it will make sh then it will ensure that you get PDF ex uh, extensions. Or is it file type? I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure how it works for DuckDuckGo, but it looks like that. Mm -hmm. well, so so there, there's plenty, and there if you can, and so some of these might not be worthwhile questions. Some of these might be kind of. Like here, they might, right here, there might be stuff about AVL trees, which we didn't co cover. There might, so if it, you see this thing and you can go, I didn't cover that, then don't worry about it. So that's the only issue with, with doing that. So, all right. So I'm going to go over here to, I think, this final. Um, Nope, not this one. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be hopping around these finals so I can make sure I hit the the things that I want to hit. All right. I like this one because it's gonna be a, because there's uh, because you know I like asking questions about different scenarios and what are good things to use. Um, I hope to amuse and entertain you with my question with my scenarios for the final exam. Um, um, the USC, the, sorry, the cs.washington.edu. I think that's the fourth one. So, in this course, we've seen many data structures, including the, which uh, specifically the following a list, a linked list of arrays, a 2D or higher array, a stack, a queue, a hash table. The hash tables, I would put the setter map in mine. Uh, again. A tree, a binary tr search tree, a direct, undirected graph. A directed graph and a directed acyclic graph. All right. So for each of the following, give me the most like most suitable data structure and give a brief justification why. Because technically everything can be thrown into an array, but you know that's not necessarily the most useful way to do things. Um, for data structures like trees and graphs, describe what information is stored in the vertices, vert vertices and edges. And if the edges are weighted, describe what information is stored in the weights. So scenario one, a map of the Puget Sound highway system used to display traffic travel times on a web page. The map displays the principal cities, the major landmarks, the inter and the intersections, the roads that connect them, and the travel times between these road along these roads. Travel times along the same road can be different in different directions. So what kind of data structure would be best for mapping this? A hash map. A hash map is a measure of key values, but look here we've got keys and values. So what would keys and values mean? Not really key values. Not a hash map. Not a hash table. So I'm going to go back to the list, right? We are going back. So here. Here's our list of data structures. We're trying to map a bunch of, you know, our 
you're trying to map locations, landmarks, and intersections. The, we're also trying to also have uh, put it, we're also trying to model the travel time along the road. This is a directed graph. So what are the vertices of this graph? Yeah, the cities, the landmarks, the, what was it, intersections? Places. Yeah, the places, the places, the places you want to get to. Yeah. Is Exactly. And not only that, because it meant, well, because as we get into it, the edges are, what are the edges? The road. And the, what are the weights on this graph? The travel time, which can be different in different directions. That's why we have that. But yes, we can also ostensibly have one-way streets. In fact, between, a lot, in, between intersections in the city, you have a lot of streets. So gets into, so there you go. Um, a chess board, an eight by eight board, used, uh, for, used for a game of chess. Each square is either empty or contains a chess piece. Okay. And you know, technically hash map is correct for everything, but very technically, but, but most, it's not necessarily the most appropriate. So let's go ahead and look back at the list. So uh, for a chess board, a 2D array. I would, in this case, use a 2D array of characters. Can you just have to animate it? No, just to like model it, oh, okay. right? Because that's the most memory efficient way to model it. And so, a you know, it's a 2D array. It's a two by two array. So use an array. It's a matrix. Use a matrix. Uh, computer model showing the dependencies between steps needed to assemble a B787 at Boeing's Everett. We're looking at dependencies. So, which of our data structures? This is one that we that you, that, yeah. What kind of graph? So, it's a special type of directed graph, though. It's the directed acyclic graph. Directed acyclic graphs are what you use when you have dependencies, right? So, for instance, say I wanted to install Eclipse on my system using my package manager. Okay. Sudo apt install Eclipse, right? Now to install Eclipse, I need a bunch of other stuff. I can't just install like the Eclipse program. It needs other stuff too. Specifically, it needs the Eclipse, uh, sorry, it needs Ant, it needs the Eclipse JDT, JDT the PDE for it, the platform, uh, it needs FastJar, and those all require different libraries, right? So some things might require other things which will require different libraries. So this is kind of like a, so this is a list of the dependencies, which is probably figures out by creating a dependency graph, right? Right, whenever you need to figure out what depends on something else, a directed acyclical graph is kind of your, your, the way to go. D, a list of legal words in a Scrabble game. We want to quickly be able to check whether the words used by players do in fact exist. A map or a set, a set, that actually be more appropriate there. But yeah, hash that there because you can check in constant time whether the word's there or not. You could also ostensibly do a list, an array list, and then do binary search, right? No, nothing wrong with that. Log n is still pretty fast, right? Um, I mean, and you're dealing with like, like I, I think only hundreds of thousands of words and like, I don't know what log base 2n of hundreds of thousands is, but it's not that much, it's a very small number. Um, describe the description of the inheritance relationships between classes and interfaces in a Java program. So remember, you can only ever extend from one parent. So that's a tree, yeah, because we're describing a, the hierarchy of, of graphs. I'm oh, sorry, of classes. <coughs> Although there is an argument to be made for directed acyclic graph if you're talking about <coughs> interfaces, because there can be multiple, because no, you can have inherent multiple. Now this one I like because you can argue because this one I think you can argue a bit about a history list recording the sites visited by the user of a web browser as new sites are vi as new sites are visited they are added to the list the list also supports the operation of going back in a web page that was previously visited before the current page and going forward to the next page visited in other words the data structure that's implementing these two buttons right here at the top uh, at the top left corner of the screen 
right? The forward back buttons. A doubly linked list, yeah. A linked list. You could also ostensibly use a stack, and then you can actually use two stacks. One for the stuff to go back, and then when you go back, you can move stuff into the forward stack, right? So those are both correct answers, I would say. There's yeah. A doubly linked list is pretty direct because you only need one instance of it, and then if, but if you want to use a stack and just push pop stuff, that also makes it pretty easy. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and to now jump to the second, uh, sorry, not to the second, to the, uh, bu -bu -bum. Let's see, yeah, to the first exam in the list, I think. Now this one exam is written, and to the last page of it, this exam is, was written in, was, was for a C course taught in C++, but it's not really gonna be that hard, we'll just do it in Java. So this is one of my favorite questions I've seen so far, um, and, I would love to ask it on exam, especially since it's so mean, but it would need more time, honestly, and it would get in the way of asking the other questions. So you're given a task file containing a week's worth of login durations for the users on aludra.usc.edu. Aludra being the uh, server there, I guess, so that, that this computer science students can log into. So each line of this file represents, uh, it corresponds to a single login session. So a line will look like a line contains the user ID, for instance, Cheng W, followed by the space character, followed by the user's login duration. So th like 314.326 for that login section, the session. So that's how many seconds they were logged in for. Your job is to compute the average, compute and print out the average login duration for each user. In other words, add up all the durations for the user, divide, sorry, add up all the durations for a user and then divide by the login sessions for that user. For example, the input file contains two login sessions for Cheng W, one for 314.326 seconds and one for 204.7 seconds. Then Cheng W259.513 should appear in your output exactly once. Okay? So um, the input is a file is unordered. So all the entries for Cheng W are not necessarily next to Cheng W. They can be interspersed with other login sessions. But the input file is well formatted, which means you don't have to check for errors in the input file. You can always you can assume that your input file is correct. You can assume, all right. So please write a partial C++ program to form this task. You can assume that this correct header has been included. In order to receive any credit. You have to use the stand, two standard library maps, in other words, hash maps, for the durate, to, one to store the duration of sums for each user and another to store the login sessions for each user. So in other words, for every single user, we want to find the, the amount of time they, lo they logged in for. And really, a map is the only realistic way of doing this. It's really the only realistic way of doing this. Any, using an array, a bunch of arrays would be a pain. So what we're going to do so I'm going to go ahead and boot up uh, Gini to do this. I've already done this one a number of times, but let's go ahead right, and continue with my scratch file over here. All right, so public static. Um, and I'll do this as a void. I'll print it out this time. Uh, print averages. And we're going to take in, um, this, we're assuming that basically the file that we're working with is given to us as file name, okay? So that, so given this is the file name of the file that we're working with. Um, I'm going to do one thing here that I wouldn't expect you to do on the final, just to make it a bit, to make it uh, the code kosher. And I'll do a throws exception, okay? And what that's going to do is that it is going to um, basically ensure that I don't have to do a try catch block in here when I open when I do the file reading because normally with the file reading I have to put uh, I have to cat try and catch a a file not found exception so here I'm just going to say I'm not going to bother with that so you, I can ignore so I can my code can look a bit cleaner so the first thing I'm going to do is just make sure I'm going I can read the file okay then I'll worry about the maps later right I have to read this file line by line. So I'll leave space up here for my maps later. Um, so let's read this file first. Scanner, a scanner is equal to new scanner 
um, not system.in, but new file, file name, right? Because we want to read from the file. Now, normally that would have to be in the try catch block, but the throws exception will prevent that for me to doing that. Now, to read the file line by line, it's fairly straightforward. And I want to read it line by line because the data is given to me, each of the relevant data is a single line. So while scanner dot has next line, I want to do the following string line is equal to scanner dot next line. Okay, so we read the line. And I like this problem because it's like, I, can, I can tell that this is something that maybe it's the person who wrote the test had to do or one of their friends had to do, right? So string line, scanner dot next line. So we're gonna read each file, so we've reach, read each line. Now each line, right, it has, it can be split up into two parts essentially. You've got your username, and then you've got the amount of time that user all uh, logged in for a session. So that, so let's go ahead and split it up into those two parts. So what I'll do is I'll do string array parts is equal to line dot split, and I'll and those two pieces of data according to the uh, according to the specifications of the file say it's going to be split by a space. So this will split it into two parts which are string user is equal to parts, right, that's the user, part zero. The user for that particular line is part zero. And then the amount of time they logged in is double uh, time, double dot next, sorry, double dot parse double parts one. So there, so I went ahead and parsed, so this will parse the file. So now I actually have to start processing the data. So to do that, I need to keep track of the number of, the, the total amount of time each user was logged in. So I'll do that, pa map string to double. The string being the user and the double being the amount of, the total amount of time that user has logged in. Um, let's see, um, login, and that will be login time new hash map. Then I'll create another map, string integer, that will be the login counts. And login counts will be the number of times that particular user has logged in. How do I know the string is a, the username is a string? Because the username is always a string. Because the username is a bunch of characters. Okay. So now that I have these two maps, what I can do is I can say I can take advantage of the fact here that if a user's been exists in the login times, then he exists in login counts. You can't have a lot. You can't have a login time without having already logged without having logged in at least once. Similarly, you can't have logged in. Um, and not have a time, and not have a time. So the keys will be identical, right? These, if one of these have these key, then both have the key. If neither, if one of them doesn't have a key, then neither of them have a key. So I only have to do one if statement. So if login counts does not contain key user. So if the user isn't in one, in in the login counts map then this is the first time we've seen them. So login counts dot put that user in that we've seen them once. And then login times we want to put in that we've seen that user for this amount of time. On the other hand, if we have seen him, then what do we want to do? We want to login counts dot put for that user we want to say we've seen him one more time so we'll get the number of times we've seen him and add one to it and add one to that value and put it back in so we retrieve the number of times we've seen that user and put it back in similarly for login times dot put we will get the we will for that user, we'll want to get the number, the amount of times he's logged in, and 
and add in that amount. Okay. Here we go. So we've now populated for every user the amount of time they're in and the amount of time that they've, uh, I'm sorry, the amount of times they've logged in. So now we need to go and compute the average, which is actually like three lines of code here. Um, if we uh, if if we include the uh, curly braces, so for string user in login counts dot key set. So for every user that we've seen, so for every user that we've seen, um, we want to system dot out dot print line. Um, user plus space plus, and now we need the average time over here. We need to generate the average time that the user has been logged in for, which is login times dot get um, get the user divided by login counts dot get the number of time that user logged in. So let's go ahead and just break that up. So print line user plus login times get user divided by login counts that get user. So the amount of time that user logged in divided by the amount of times that use it locked in. Well, that's that for that problem. Even though it looks really intimidating, it was a matter of just parsing the file. And so I like that problem because it is, it looks like a lot and it can be a lot, but if you use the maps, it's a particularly nice problem. Let me see, um, so let's go back to this problem. Okay, so let's go back to this fourth exam over here the Washington exam. So let's look at this other coding problem. Nodes in an integer binary tree can be represented using the following data structure. Class BT node has an integer item and a left and a right. Complete definition of the BFS below to perform a breadth first traversal of a binary tree and print the node data values in the order they're reached during the search. So in other words, they want to do a binary, they want to do a breadth first uh, traversal of the tree. Okay. Now we've done in order, post order, and pre order. But a po now a breadth first traversal that's the same as you would do it in a graph, but simpler. It's also called a level order traversal, right? If we take a look at, um, let me just look in. Sorry, let me just jump now back to this exam again because it has a tree in here. Let's take a look at this tree. A level order traversal or breadth first traversal, that will be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J, K. That is the, that's the order we'd be going in. So, what I, so what's interesting about this one? Okay, in this solution, you may create and use instances of what other, of other standard data structures, lists, skews, stacks, trees, hash tables, graphs, or whatever. <clears throat> uh, you know, that's fairly standard for, um, on the actual exam. You can do whatever you can, if you need to make a data structure, you can. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so let's do, so let's go ahead and do this breath first uh, problem. Public static, a public void BFS or tree BFS, right? Because this would exist in a tree node e root, right? Unlike this other stuff, it will be recursive because you don't want to do breath, you don't want to try to do a breath first uh, recursive method, right? It would kind of be a bit of a mess. Instead, what we need for a breath first uh, traversal is a queue. Queue of node of e's, right? Because we'll want to know what nodes we're traversing through. And then we need to give it a meaningful name, which I'll do by just giving it a single letter. It's equal to new 
linked list. Why a linked list? Um, well, we want a linked list because, because in Java, you can't actually do this because Q is an interface, so we implement a Q using a linked list. So node Q is, so Q of nodes, Q is equal to a linked list, right? So we create our linked list, and that's actually all we really need for this. So what we, we start by doing Q.offer to add the, to put our root in, to put our starting thing in, and then while Q.isEmpty equal equals false, right? So while it's not empty, which we could just simply do, which I like to do by doing this, so while it's not empty, node e current is equal to q dot offer. Sorry, q dot pull to get the most recent thing out of there. Pull. Really doing a great job typing here. So uh, node e, we get our current node. Um, and what did it want it to do? It wanted to print out the node values in the order we reached during this, in the search. So system, dot out, dot print line, current, dot item. So now that we found the value we need to, and printed it out, we need to go ahead and visit our children. Which means that uh, if root dot left, so if I have a left child, so if I have a left child, I'm going to go ahead and add it to the queue. Q.offer current dot, no, not root dot left. If root dot left, that would be wrong. If current dot left, current dot left is equal to null, is not equal to null. If I have a left child, add it. And if I have a right child, add it to the queue. And that's it. That's all I need for this, right? Because the queue does all the magic, right? I put my first node in, then I put in my, my nodes, my first node's left child, then it's right child. Then I put in the, my left child's, then my left child's left and right child, and then my right child's left and right child. And so on and so forth. So. All right, moving on to question four. Here's an adjacency list representation of a directed graph. No weights are assigned to the edges. Okay, so here's an adjacency list. Part A, draw the directed graph represented by the adjacency list. That's not too hard. The adjacency list is saying A got, uh, got the node B, C, it's got uh, edges between B, C, and D. B has an edge to A. C has an edge to B and D, and D doesn't have an edge to A. Now these are, this, it says also this is a direct graph. So this is fairly easy to draw. I'll draw A, B, C, D. And then I will draw the appropriate edges. Uh, A has edges to B, C, and D. list, what would an adjacency matrix for the same graph look like? Draw the ma adjacency matrix for the graph. I don't think really draw is right, the right word for adjacent for a matrix though. Like unless we're like, unless like matrices are supposed to have like embroidery on it that I didn't know about. So for the same graph, let's look at the way an adjacency uh, matrix would look.
So we've got A, B, C, and D. And then for an adjacency matrix, we use a one to represent the presence of a direct edge, and a zero to represent nothing. I'll just leave it blank if there's a zero there. So A has an edge to B, C, and D. B has an edge to A. C has an edge to B, and D. And D has no edges to anywhere. So that's what that will look like. So that's a fairly straightforward problem. All right, now another big review because again, I just, this is going to be in the final, I want to review this as much better example than we did last time, which is this uh, Dijkstra's algorithm on this directed graph. It's actually also a, well, that was weird. Um. Okay, hold on a second. Sorry, my, I don't know what happened. I like didn't even touch anything. It says, okay, so I've been, my computer, sorry, this is informing that that's not my mistake. There we go. All right, so Dijkstra's algorithm on this graph. All right, so we want to perform Dijkstra's algorithm on this graph over here. Uh, and what they, the other thing is that they like want me to know what, uh, you know, cross. It's a, in this one they ha they would want you to cross out the distances as we get to them. But honestly, we can just do it without really anything, any additional information. So, so let's just perform Dijkstra's on this graph. So Dijkstra's refer means that we need a we need, and we're going to start from one for this. Also, notice it's a directed acyclic graph, which is pretty interesting. So to do. And done are our sets. One is going to be done since we're starting there. And then the nodes that we have to do are two, three, four, five, six. Then we have our nodes, our distances, and our predecessor. So one, and they want me to list them all out one, two, three, four, five, six. Right? So the distance to node one from itself is zero, and it has no predecessor, so we'll initialize that. So let's initialize the, the, the rest of the list. To get from one to two, it, it costs two, and we get there from one. To get from two to three, sorry, to get, from, to get to three from one, we don't know what it is, so we put down infinity, we get there from one. To get to four, we get there from one. I have no idea what they're doing. All right, infinity. And then infinity one. Right, so this is the initialization for our graph. All right. So now we need to go through and find which of these has the lowest cost that's the in to do. So two has the lowest cost out of all, out of these four nodes. So let's go ahead and take a look at the, at the edges that two adds for us. Two has the edges three and five. So the cost to get to five is, th is from two is the cost to get to two plus three, which is a grand total of five. Now, is five less than the current cost it takes to get to five? Yes, it is. The current cost to get to five is, infin is infinity. So we can say we can get to five with a cost of five from node two. Let's look over here to node three. Getting from node two to node three costs f a grand total of five plus the cost to get to two, which is a cost of seven. Seven happens to be uh, less than infinity, so we put down seven and we can get we can get to node three 
4 cos of 7 by going through 2. All right, we can get from 1 to 4, and then from we can... There we go. So now we've got the re so now we've got three, four, five, six. Which of these are the cheapest? Whoops. Which of these is the cheapest one? Uh, four is the cheapest. So that's the next node that we we found the shortest distance to. So let's go ahead and look at the new uh, edges that four brings us. Four has a single edge from one to, from from to three. Now the cost to get to three from four is one plus the cost to get to four which is a grand total of four. Now, is four cheaper than our current cost for three? Our current cost for three is seven, so yes. So we update and say we can get to node three for cost of four from node four. So now we've got three, five, and six. The cost to get to three, four, five. So this is the cheapest cost. So we now say we're done with that three. We figured out the cheapest cost for. And now let's look at three's edges. Three has one edge front that goes to six. So the cost to get to six would be two plus the cost to get to three, which is four. So that would be a grand total of six to get to six. That's less than infinity, so we update and say we can get to six for a cost of six by, using, by going through three. How do we get to node three? Well, we would go there by node four. How would you get to node four? Well, we'd go there by node one. How do you get to node one? Well, that's your starting point. Which is the, so this, this predecessor tells you everything in, you need to know about the path. Okay, so now we have two nodes left, five and six. So five has the edge from five to six, that's four. So is four plus the current cost to get to five less than the cost it currently takes to get to six? So is four plus the cost of five less than six? Four plus the cost of five is five, that's nine. Nine is not less than six, so we don't bother updating it. And then finally, six is the last node, and it doesn't have any useful edges, so we bring that out. So that's our table for Dijkstra's algorithm. And as we go to the next section, it says, list the, ordices in the, ver uh, list the vertices in the order they're processed in the algorithm. Well, it was one, two, four, three, five, six. All right, so let's skip these for a second. Um, so quick sorts worst case runtime is O of n squared, but it has expected runtime of n log n if the partition function works well. What needs to be true about the partition function in order for a runtime to be n log n? In practice, how do we ensure that this happens? So why does the worst case of O of n squared happen? Yes. Sorry. No, I'm ta I'm talking about quick sort. Quick sort, right? We're choosing a partition. Sorry, we're doing the partition function. What has to be true for the partition function to what hap oh, what? what ha That would, eh. we have to be have an unlucky pivot is what I'm talking about. If we have, if, so if un, if we're, so if quicksort takes O of n squared time, that means that our pivot is always the worst pivot, right, we could choose. Basically everything would be greater than or less than our pivot, right? So we're always happen to choose a number that's greater than or less than our pivot. So and if, we, if that happens, then only one item gets sorted each run through and each run through would take O of n time. So it would be O of n squared. Now, what do we, so how do we get n log n time then in quick sort? What, happened, what has to happen with our pivot and our partition function to get n log n time? So in that case, we'll be, uh, so for us to get n log n, with quicksort, we want to be able to split it in half each time, basically evenly in half. If we split it in evenly in half each time, then we can get n log n uh, for quicksort, and it will run really, really quickly. 
but um, we don't get to split it in half each time, right? But in order to split it in half, that means that the pivot, every time we choose it, it needs to be the median value, right? The median value of the, of the list or sublist that we're doing. Yes? Yeah. So, and then all the number, maybe it's not order, but like they are in the right side of the pivot. Yes. It will cause like not able to split it. That's exactly right. Is that like the worst case? Yes, that is the worst case. So for n log, so for to get n log m, we want it to be split between all the, we want it an even split between all the items less than our pivot, all the items greater than our pivot, which means the pivot needs to be the median value, the value in between the two. Um, now, or, so in practice, though, we can't just pick out the median value, right? So what we generally do is that we try to, approx so what our book's suggestion was is that we should just approximate the median value, right? We should, we'll ch should take the first number, the last number, and the middle number of our range, and we will figure out which one of those is the median value of those three, and that will, and we'll use that as our pivot. That way there's n always going to be some split, even if it's a small split. So in practice, by, we, so in practice we rig our pivot so that it's a median value. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, let's see initially. That seems like a partition function, but um, yeah. Suppose we have an array of containing b, a b containing n integers. Initially, the integers are in some random order. We'd like to rearrange the array so that all the negative numbers precede all the zeros, all the positive numbers appear at the end. In this picture, we'd like to rearrange the contents of B so that in the end, we get this. All the numbers less than zero, all the numbers greater than zero, and, sorry, all the numbers equal to zero, all the numbers greater. Simply trying to hack this up is a mess. Try it for two minutes if you're not gonna do this. However, if we draw a picture showing what computation looks like when it's partially finished, and use that to a guide of coding, that's much more treatable. Specifically, once we have partially but not completely moved the data, the array should look like this. In other words, I'll put all the items here that are less than zero, all the items that are equal to zero, whatever this is, and then O of n. Some of these intervals must, can maybe be empty if no numbers for the correct values have been found. So then it says to complete the code for the array. Now this one's an interesting one to try. Um, basically, you're, you'd, I think you'd essentially do, be doing a modification of the partition function. Just Essentially, you have three sections rather than, you have essentially, uh, you know, multiple sections rather than two. Let's see. Don't want to try that. Don't want to go over that one. Let's see what else. What time is it currently, anyway? How much time do we have? So we still have plenty of time. So um, we also, did we go, and we went over this problem yet on Monday, right? Uh, insertion sort versus merge sort, right? Did we cover this Monday? Um, anybody remember? I believe we covered this one on Monday, right? Yes, did we? Uh, yeah. yeah? We did. We did? You did? Okay. The morning class didn't. All right. So let me go ahead. And then there was another question over here that I really happen to like. So suppose we insert, we first insert an, item, an element x into a binary search tree that does not already have x. Suppose then that we immediately delete x from the tree. Will the new tree be identical to the original one? If yes, give the reason in no more than three sentences. If no, give a counterexample. Draw pictures if, nece if necessary. So, um, so okay. He's asking essentially if you add an item to, the, to it and if you add an item to a binary search tree and they're removed from a binary search tree, do you end up with the same tree? 
right? Is it, same, is it effectively as if you had done nothing? Has the tree changed at all? So it's an excellent question. So, what ha so when you add an, a node to, or when you add an item to the tree, when you add an item to a binary search tree, where does that new item end up? It ends up all the way at the bottom. It ends up at a leaf. Now, if we were to delete that node, that means we'd be deleting what? A leaf. How, how much does deleting a leaf change, does deleting a leaf change any of the other nodes in the tree? When we're deleting a leaf, does it change any of the other nodes in the tree? No, it doesn't, it doesn't change it at all. So, in our, so, in our, so effectively, this just simply adds a leaf and then removes a leaf without touching anything in between, so it doesn't change anything. Now, if this was a binary, now if this was a ba uh, self-balancing binary search tree, then you'd have an argument that it could switch something because it could rebalance. You could add an item, rebalance it, and then remove it, and then it doesn't, and then it wouldn't need to be rebalanced though, unnecessarily. And so you'd end up with a complete different tree. So problem uh, eight. Suppose we have a heap of uh, H and we have two values, one and two, such that all the values are distinct. Let heap one, two be the heap if you insert v1 and then v2 into the heap. And then two, one be the heap you get if you insert v2 and then v1 into the heap. Give an example h, v1 and v2, such that h12 is not equal to h21. No justification is needed, just draw the heap h12 and 21. Right? Which simply means is that it's kind of the same as the problem above, but in reverse and with the heap. What we want to do is that show, is we want to show that it's possible to have a heap where we add in two items in a different order, right? And so long as we insert the items uh, in a different order, the heap looks different, where the heap has is differently has different uh, has different arrangement of values. So generally, when I so let's so I'm going to go ahead and pull some numbers, um, right? Let's. Generally, I find values to be best to be dealing with small values in the current situation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to let v1 be equal to one. Well, just have a sorry, not a small value, but just but like a huge disparity between these values. V1 is going to be one. Uh, v2 is going to be ten to the tenth power, which is generally a very big number. Um, so those are two values that I'll add to the heap. Now I'll define h as a min heap, and the, with the and uh, it will be a min heap that looks like this. Zero. So now let's see what happens when we add uh, v1 and v2. If I add v1 and v2, I'll get one and ten to the ten. And if I add, and then if I add um, v2 and then v1 instead, I'll get ten. To in different heaps. I mean, that one was a bit of an easy problem, I think. Um, OK. So let's see, what time, what time do we have now? 4.23. All right. So um, just trying to think about what other problems I can kind of show you. Uh, all right. There were other questions in here, um, I think. OK. Yeah. So question, So let's take a look at over here. What is the organizational property obeyed by all nodes in a binary search tree, i.e., the binary search tree property? You can assume that all the values in a binary search tree are unique. So what's, what makes a binary, in other words, what makes a binary search tree a binary search tree? And not just a binary tree. Just the leaves are all sorted. Uh, the leaves are all sorted, but you've got your group, right, of your tree, your subtree, and then you've got all the items that are less than it in the left. Oh, that's tree. all. Yep. All. Yeah. So for binary search, tree, what makes a binary search tree a binary search tree is that you have, um, you have, is that you have your root of your tree. And then all, all the 
write all the notes, that was all the items to the, that are less than your root are in the left subtree, and all your items to the right, uh, sorry, that are greater go into the right subtree, and your left subtree and your right subtree are both binary search trees, which is <coughs> really important. Your left tree and your right tree have to be both have to be binary search trees. So let the key of a node in a binary search tree be x. Let's call this node node x. Please give a definition of predecessor x. In other words, the in-order predecessor of x. So what is the in-order predecessor of x? Right. Something we've gone over. What is the in-order predecessor of x? That's actually the answer to part two, oh. which is that given that you are known x, right, and you want to find your predecessor, next in-order predecessor, you go one to the left and go all the way to the right. That's how you find it. So what is he though? What is the big what what the greatest number? It is the Yeah, it's the biggest thing that is smaller than you. That is your predecessor. It is the biggest thing that is smaller than you. You go and the way you find it is that you go one to the left to find you go into your left subtree because that's where all the smaller stuff is located. And then you go all the way to the right to find the biggest thing in that. So now continuing from part part B. What's your in-order successor? What would that be? The smallest number that's bigger than you. How do you get there? Go one to the right, all the way to the left. All right. Um, why is it sometimes better to use a red-black tree or an ABL tree rather than a normal binary search tree? Now, if you remember, ABL trees and right red-black trees, they, we, we mentioned that they exist, but we didn't really get the chance to cover them. They are self-balancing trees, right? These are self-balancing search trees. Okay. So why would they be? Why are those best? Why would you want to use a self-balancing uh, binary search tree rather than a normal binary search tree? I mean, like the ad method for for red black tree is like forty is like forty lines long. It's terrible. It keeps the runtime log in. That's exactly right. It keeps it log in because in a binary search tree, the worst case is full of n time. But for a red black tree, it's or an ABL tree, it ensures that since it's balanced, it will take log n time to get anything done. Okay. So ideal hashing function and perfect hashing are not practical and general approaches for handling hash tables. In other words, we can't build a giant. Uh, array and just cash everything to so, so, so that every key goes to a unique slot. So give three practical and general approaches for handling uh, handling collisions and hash tables. Please note that if only two if two answers are very similar in their basic approaches, they will be counted as only one answer. So what are the so we only learned two ways to handle uh, collisions. What are the two ways we handle collisions um, using in hash tables that we learned? So there's a linked list method which is called uh, which is called chaining. You can do it with chaining, and that just simply means that every slot, if more than one thing needs to go into a slot, they go into the same linked list at that slot. What about what's the other way? Yep. What's that called? Something, something. It's a two-term word, right? Open addressing. Open addressing. So, and there's different ways to do open addressing. You can use linear probing or quadratic probing, but they're still open addressing. There's other ways. There's also solutions for doing it, like um, let's, there's other ways to resolve uh, collisions. Uh, I don't know how to spell it. Hashing. Cuckoo hashing is a scheme in computer programming for resolving hash collisions um, in in a table. Worst case, constant time lookup. It names from the derives from the behavior of some species of cuckoo, where the cuckoo ki uh, chick pushes the other eggs or young out of the nest when it hatches. Um, analogously, inserting a new key into cuckoo hashing table may push an older key 
to a different location. So in other words, you insert, and what you do when you insert is that if it's in your spot, you kick it out of your spot and take it. Um, now that is a form of open addressing, it says, but, um, but it is, so I haven't, but that's just one form of doing it. There's, uh, but there's a b number of other approaches. You can also use uh, double hashing, which is that if, you, if your first hash function results in a collision, you can have a secondary backup hash function, right? So if h of x doesn't work, you can try g of x, right, instead. That's another scheme for doing that. So, all right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the, this binary search tree, right? There's different ways to, uh, right? We have learned three, well now four ways of traversing the binary search tree. So what would the expected out, so what would we get if we did a pre-order traversal of this binary search tree? Pre-order would be A, then B, then D, right? It's root, then left subtree, then right subtree. So A, B, D, then E, H, then C, F, G, G, K. What about an in order? Well, that means do my left subtree, do myself, then do my right subtree. So it would actually be, well, A would say do my left subtree, B would say do my left subtree, so D would do its left, so it would go D, then B, H, E, A, F, J, C, K, G. So it's a bit more weird, especially since, you know, it's not alphabetical, it doesn't produce something in alphabetical order. Um, because that's not the way they have stuff arranged. And then post order means do my left subtree, then my right subtree, then do myself. So A says call left, B says call left, so we get D, H, E, B, J, F, K, G, C, A for our traversal. And I, so with that, honestly, I think we've got, um, we've got, I think I've done plenty. We've got 20 minutes remaining, so I'd like to use the remaining time for if you've got questions on stuff with your labs or you want to demo something, then you can go ahead and do that. So we'll have our timed lab tomorrow and Friday, right? That will be, that will be on a linked list. So that will be a question on linked list like a, a similar to the type you got on the first exam, and then there will be a question on trees similar to the ones you got on the um, on the second exam and on the second time lab. So they're going to both be static methods, so you don't have to mess with nodes.